Welcome to Central Baptist Paragold Campus. My name is Blake, and if I haven't met you, and I am uh, the teaching pastor, have the honor and responsibility and, and privilege to stand up here uh, most weeks and open the Word of God to you so that we can all grow in grace and knowledge and uh, people can be saved and God can impact eternity in people's lives, and it's a blessing to be able to do that this morning. Um, I don't know, for whatever reason, I was just so... Uh, overwhelmed with gratitude for this church, uh, for you guys, for your families, and uh, for what I get to do. And uh, I, I don't take it for granted, and I'm really, really grateful uh, to be a pastor on this staff. Um, it's really a great honor and a privilege. Um, so anyway, with, with, with that being said, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them, to Mark chapter 4. And if you don't have them, the passage will be here on the screen this morning, and it's also there in your notes as well. And we, uh, Mark chapter 4 is committed to uh, Jesus teaching specifically in parables. And we looked last week uh, at the parable of the soils. And if you did not hear that sermon, I would, I would really encourage you to do that because that parable sets off the rest of them, that the condition of our hearts determines everything else that takes place after that. Now, before we dive into these next three parables, actually, because right after this, Jesus is going to go into three different parables about what the kingdom of God is like. And before we do that, I want to ask you a question. I want you to think through a question that maybe you have never asked before in your life or maybe not asked it this way. But my question to you this morning is why... Would God save you? And I actually want you to think of an answer. Why would God save you? Why would God save anyone? And I want you just to sit on that for a moment. Because the truth is, I mean, Scripture tells us that we were his enemies before we were saved, that we don't deserve his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness, we, we, are, we are not worthy candidates. We, we haven't racked up enough good works for him to say, you know what, they're good enough. It, it hasn't at all. So why would he do it at all? Why would God save you? Why would he, he forgive you for your sins? Why would he do it? And for most of you, let me, let me ask this. I'm going to do it this way. And we'll do this this way. And then if, if it doesn't work, then 11 o'clock we'll do it a little differently. But... I want you to have an answer in your mind right now. Like, I, I want you to think about what, what reason did God have for saving me? Why would, if you are saved here this morning, you've been born again, you've repented and believed in the gospel, and you've been forgiven. Why did he do that? I want you to raise your hand if your answer is because he loves us. Just raise your hand. Wow. A, a huge majority. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. Man, let's go. A lot of hands been raised in a Baptist church this morning. I love it. It's good. And, and you would be right. I mean, that, that's very biblical, very true. I mean, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so love, uh, Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so God's love for you and me is a massive motivator for you being saved. And if you're here this morning and you're not saved, you have not yet repented and believed in Jesus, you need to know that God loves you, that he desires to save you. He desires to forgive you for your sins. But you may have thought of other reasons. Maybe you thought, he, maybe if you're a little bit more theological, you thought he wants to, this brings him glory to save people. And you're right as well that, that salvation ultimately brings God more glory. Uh, that that is absolutely true. Uh, some people may have thought, well, he, he wants us to spend eternity with him. He wants us to be in heaven with him. And you would also be right. The gospel of John records Jesus's prayer there in John 17. And Jesus is literally praying, God, I, and my paraphrased version is, I can't wait to be with those whom you've given me. I cannot wait to be with them in heaven. And that would be absolutely a right reason for God 
to save you, but I want to present to you another reason that maybe you have never thought about in your life, that has never crossed your mind, at least this way. And we're going to see this answer this morning in this passage of Scripture. But I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. That God has saved you and me if you are truly born again, not just because of his love for you, but his love for the people around you. That God loves the people that are in your life, your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors, your coworkers. God, in fact, loves them also that he has saved you, rescued you, and forgiven you so that you can display that love, that grace, that forgiveness to them as well. That yes, God saved you because he loved you, but he also saved you in the timing and the reason and the place and the period of time that he did so that, or in order that, he could display his love to the people around you who don't yet know Christ. And I don't think we've ever really thought about that. That he saved us because of the people around us as well. That he purchased us and then has called us to this very unique calling. And we're going to see what disciples actually do when they've been born again. So remember, last week we ended with the, the good soil. That the good soil, Jesus says, is those who hear the word, which is the gospel, remember, they hear about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, they receive it, and then it says that they produce a harvest, 30, 60, or 100-fold. So the people who have truly been born again, they do something, and it multiplies, and it multiplies, and it multiplies, some 30, some 60, and some 90. And what he wants us to understand is when the kingdom and the gospel has been placed in someone, it produces a multitude of fruit. Well, what is the fruit? What is, what is, the, what is the result of someone who has received the gospel on good soil, broken, humbled soil, and what does it produce? Well, what we're going to see this morning are three things, three parables that Jesus teaches that are going to display the fruit and how it's displayed, and how we are to observe and interact with it. What does it look like for soil to be good and to produce fruit? And what is the fruit? God has saved you because not only does he love you, but he loves the people around you. So what do true believers, what does their life look like? We're going to see in these three parables here. So you may be here this morning, and you may think, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. I've been saved. Well, the question you then need to ask is, are these things being produced in my life? And if they're not, then the reality is, one, you either are unconverted, you are not yet a born-again believer, or you are not taking hold of the full potential that God has for you. You are hindering the work of God as opposed to ushering it in. And so this morning we're going to see what disciples, what the good soil produces. So join me in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 21. And he was saying to them, so he has finished the parable of the soils, explaining that, and he now is explaining a new parable to his disciples. And it says, he was saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be under, or excuse me, yes, it's not brought to be under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on a lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to, except to be revealed. Nor has anything been secret, but that would come to light. If anyone has ears, let him hear. And he was saying to them, he continues this teaching by saying, Take care what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And more will be given you besides. For whoever has to him, more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. We're going to pause right there. This is the first parable that we're going to see, the first fruit of a true, genuine disciple. So we're going to look at this this morning. But I want to pray for us as we dive into this first parable. Father, I, I cannot, with a thousand sermons, 
put in our hearts, even my own, a genuine love for lost people, a genuine love for the Great Commission, and for your purposes and will to be done. And so, Father, I I admit that, I confess that right now, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you would bring that to us. You would bring to us a genuine longing for people to come to know Jesus. You would bring to us this morning clarity of soul and mind and heart. Lord, I I really do believe there are some here who are, are not truly born again, but have walked in believing themselves to be. And I pray that in Jesus' name, your kindness and your grace would lead them to repentance this morning, that they would see clearly that they, in fact, are not yet yours. God, for those who are, I pray that you would produce in their life 30, 60, and 100-fold fruit. That, God, you would produce in them fruit that comes with them into eternity. So, God, I pray that you would do what I can't do this morning. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The three truths we're going to see this morning are pretty simple. The first parable teaches this, two words, disciples witness. Disciples witness, or another way of saying it is disciples work. They work. He he starts off this parable, a short parable, or a short actually like illustration almost. And he says, a lamp is not brought to be under a basket, is it? Or under a a bed, but it's brought to be put on a lampstand. That was a very common practice in that day. We can understand that. They didn't have electricity back then. So they had lamps. And if you lit a lamp, you put oil in it. Oil was expensive. You had the wick in there. You light it. you, You lit the thing. Like it was a process to get light into your home. Nobody would have taken the light and then placed it under a bed or grabbed a basket and put it on top of that light. It would have made no sense to anyone to go to all that work, spend the money, do all those things, and then put the light under a basket. And Jesus is making that illustration connected to what he just said about the soils to help them understand this first point, that if someone truly has the light, they don't hide it. They don't put it under a basket or under a bed. And what he's saying is if the gospel has truly come to you, you have received the word, you in fact don't hide it. You share it. And he goes on to say, you know, you don't just, you don't hide it. You actually put it on a lampstand so that it can be shown through the whole house. That is an illustration for us to understand that true disciples shine the light that they have been given where they go. Your lampstand is your home. Your lampstand is your work. Your lampstand is your marriage. Your lampstand is when you're just out going through the city and and, and doing business and going to Walmart. That is your lampstand. And he said, those who have truly received the light, they shine it. They witness. They share the gospel. And my question to us this morning is at this point in your life, who, if Jesus came back, everything was finished, done, it's all over. And you're standing before Christ, and everybody else is there with you, everybody waiting for Jesus to to decide, how many people that are in that line, okay? Now, it's not going to be a line, but if it were a line, how many people in that line when Jesus gets to you and he says, hey, uh, here's, uh, here's Brad. Who here heard the gospel or saw Jesus through Brad or through Ben or through Sarah? Raise your hand, please. I want you to put yourself in that moment right there for just a second. Who's raising their hand? I did. They invited me to church at Walmart one day. I did. That's my dad. He told me about Jesus his whole life. I did. She went on a mission trip and came and sacrificed and shared the gospel with me. I I came to know Jesus because of her, because of him. That's what Jesus is saying here. That someone who has truly received the word in good soil, the fruit of that are lives who have been changed with the gospel. Now, obviously, we can't affect the results. 
But who behind you would raise their hand and say, I heard about Jesus from them. I know Christ because of them. Disciples witness. And he goes on here and he says, for nothing is hidden except that which is to be revealed and nothing has been secret but that which would come to light. Jesus is ultimately saying here, you can't hide. If you have the light, you're going to shine it. If you don't have the light, you're not going to shine it. And everything that is secret or everything that we, we, every game that we think we may be playing with him, it's going to be revealed one day. That we can play a game here, like we can joke, like, oh, I love Jesus and I'm so in love with him. But like one day that's going to come to light. Like one day the truth about us is going to be revealed. The secrets about us are going to be revealed. I had a professor in seminary always say that, that, that our secret life is open life in heaven. That our secret life is actually an open life in heaven. That God sees everything. There's no secrets. And one day all of this and who we really are is actually going to be revealed. He's alluding back to the soils. One day the condition of your heart is going to be revealed. And so he goes on he says this. He teaches them further and he says, take care what you listen to. He's literally saying that disciples are cautious and alert to what they're hearing and listening. And he goes on to say this, this is the reward of witnessing, of sharing the gospel or of working for the kingdom. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you and more will be given to you besides. And then he explains what he's saying in verse 25. For whoever has, this is important, this is incredibly important. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. He is referring to those who are the Good soil, the last soil, and the first three. Remember, two of the three believed themselves to be born again and saved. And what he's ultimately saying is, you will reap what you sow. That God will give reward to you. Not just in heaven, but here on earth. If you choose to, by the grace and help of God, reflect Christ through your life. Share the gospel. Fight through the awkwardness. Fight through the reluctancies. Fight through your guilt or your shame or your fear. And you, you, you share the gospel. You show the light. You spread the seed of the good word. What he's saying here is you will be rewarded for that. God will bring more grace, more blessing, and more things into your life when you display and show the gospel. You will reap what you sow, not only here in this life, but throughout eternity. He gives us a motivation. Should not only forgiveness of sins be enough motivation for us, but he goes on to say, hey, listen, if you choose to take your light and to shine it on a lampstand, whatever that lampstand is and wherever it is, I will reward you far beyond what you ever could imagine. And that's not just financially. Like It's not like, oh, that's not, this is not the prosperity gospel. He's saying you will get more of God as you display more of God. God will bring more into your life, more blessing and grace and favor when you open your life up and say, God, shine your light through me. What do you want to do today through me? Every day we have a choice to display someone through our lives, through our choices, through our words. And we're either displaying us or we're displaying Christ. And what he's first saying here is those who are truly disciples, who have received the word, the 30, 60, and 100 fold fruit is they're displaying the gospel. They witness. They work. It is a natural outpouring that someone who's truly born again, who has the light, does not want to keep it internal. I hear people say that often. Well, this is just between me and the Lord. You know, my relationship with Jesus is my relationship with Jesus. I, I didn't, didn't have to affect anybody else. You heard the world say that. That's good for you. That's, your Jesus is good for you, but it's not, it's not, that's not me. That's not my truth. A lot of postmodern thinkers and just college-age students and professors are, hey, that's cool for you. That's not my truth. But the reality is if you have the light, you can't help but shine it. You cannot help but display what Christ has done in you. I think that most of the Bible Belt is lost and doesn't know Jesus because the reality is they don't care about anyone else coming to Christ. They'll show up at church. They'll serve at a picnic They'll, they'll do something. They'll serve a Sunday school. But it, reality, like the true depths of their heart, they truly do not desire for anyone to come to Christ. And the, it's shown by their prayer life and their words. Let me ask you this. I want you to think about this. Because this is like both encouraging and sobering. 
If over the last month, okay, over the last month, if God answered every prayer that you prayed over the last month, every one of them, small ones, big ones, whatever, the ones you whispered, the ones you've even forgotten of, if he answered every prayer you prayed over the last month, how many people would be saved because of that? Like how many people in your life would be born again? I think there's a lot of people, especially in the Bible Belt, potentially even in this room, that that would be zero. Zero. You'd have more money. You'd have less stress. You'd have nicer cars. Your kid would quit rebelling against you. All those things are, I guess, fine to pray for. How many people will come to know Jesus if God answered every prayer that you prayed over last month? What about the last year? How many people would truly be born again if every one of your prayers were answered? My friends, when you have the light, you show it. And when you see someone's prayer life, prayer life, you see who they really are. And if you're here this morning, you're like, Blake, I know that I'm saved. I know I'm born again. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Over the last year, no one would be saved if God answered every prayer that I had. Well, here's the encouragement. That doesn't have to continue. That today your prayer life and your actions and your life can change. You're not dead. You're not standing before God giving account of your life. How many people have you shared the gospel with? How many people over the last year have heard come out of your mouth, man, Jesus has died for my sins, he was buried and he rose again, and I can't help but talk about it. How many people have you shared that with in the last year? Because disciples produce fruit, and the fruit is the light coming out of your life. That is the result. There's, there's no other result other than what he's doing in you and what he's doing through you. There was a young man that I recently uh, went over to his house. His name's Cole. And I'm good friends with his parents. And Cole began, he and his brother, began to ask questions about Jesus and about their salvation. They're very close to the same age as my own son. And so uh, his parents called me uh, to come over and just sit down with them and talk to both of their boys about Jesus. And uh, so we did. We sat down and we talked about the Lord and we talked about their salvation. And we walked through the gospel of how, what Jesus did for them, how he died for them, how he calls us to respond to his gospel and repentance and faith because he loves them. And um, when I was talking to Cole specifically, Cole said, you know, and, and his parents had shared this with me, but also he shared this with me. He articulated this, that one of his holdups uh, to giving his life to Jesus was he was uh, rightly nervous to get in front of people, to be baptized. That that for a lot of people, even adults, is, is a thing of, of having to get in front of people and to do that. And, and that's a fine reality. Matter of fact, it's the number one fear in humans is standing before people and talking. This is, this is the number one fear. Over like being burned and drowning. It's like, wow, that's significant fear. And he, that young man felt it. And so for a couple of years, he kind of battled with his salvation because he didn't want to get in front of people. He was afraid to be in front of people. So after we share the gospel, and what was really neat is both of them get saved that moment, which is really neat. That family will get to celebrate that for the rest of their life. Those two boys coming to faith together, those two brothers giving their lives to Jesus on the same day. But when Cole, after Cole, prayed and asked Christ to save him, he went from, I've been really nervous to get in front of people, to then we began to talk about baptism. And his brother was like, I want to get baptized Easter Sunday. Like, I want to, let's just do it tomorrow. Let's do this thing. And, uh, you know, they were kind of talking through that. And he wanted, actually, his brother wanted to get baptized on Saturday. Of Easter, you know, and Saturday service was big, but it wasn't the biggest service we were going to have. I mean, there was, there was a good crowd here on Saturday night, but Cole said, I don't want to get baptized on Saturday. And I kind of, I kind of sat back. I was like, oh, he's still kind of like, oh, I don't want to do this. And he said, confidently, I'm talking four minutes into his salvation. He said, I don't want to get baptized on Saturday. I want to get baptized on Sunday at 930 because that's when the most people are going to be there. And I was like, look, look at you, bro. Look at you. This kid that literally four minutes before that was like, I don't want to get in front of people. I don't want people to, I don't want people to see me. Immediately after he gets the spirit of God in him, that Holy Spirit begins to churn in him and changing him. And he's like, Saturday, 
Let's go full sin, 930, 12, 1500 people in one service. Let's do it. I want the most people that can possibly see it, see it. And listen, if you know this young man, you know that is like not his normal personality. What is that? That is the light of the gospel. That when you receive Jesus, you don't want to hide anymore. You don't want to just get that light and then put it under a basket. You want people to see what Jesus has done in your life. Disciples, they witness. They share the good news of the gospel. Secondly, that's the work, okay? That is the work or the fruit of a disciple. The next two parables that Jesus shares are the fun part. This is what's cool. Jesus is really awesome in how he lays this out. Here's the parable. Let's look with me at the second parable, beginning in verse 26. So first off, disciples, they witness or they work. Their work is sharing of the gospel. They don't hide the light. But then secondly, he says, and he was saying, verse 26, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. So another parable here. And he goes to bed at night and he gets up by day and the seed sprouts and it grows. How he himself does not know. The soil produces crop by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. The second thing that we see about disciples is not only do they work and and witness But secondly, they watch. They watch or they wait. He tells a second parable about disciples. And it's that they go and they they put the seed in the ground. Again, remember, the seed is the gospel. He is continuing this idea of the gospel. And he says that they go and they share the gospel with people. He's alluding to the illustration here, this farmer. Oh, there's a lot of farmers. I see multiple farmers in the room. You get this process. You put the seed in the ground. You water, you pray, you do all these things. But the reality is farmers can do a lot of stuff, but they cannot make crops grow. You cannot make a seed that's dead come back to life and sprout a a, a blade and then a head. And then they cannot do that. It is a miracle. They have to wait and watch that. And they would have understand it just like we understand it today. You cannot make plants grow. You can do everything they need, but you can't make them grow. And Jesus is telling this parable to help us understand that once you've sown the gospel into the lives of people, you step back and you watch and you wait. Because the miracle of salvation is not on you, it's on Christ. He does the work. Just like plants will not grow unless God whispers to every single one of those plants, it's time. How beautiful a process is that? The seed goes in the ground and dies, and then it comes back to life, and it produces. Like, that is wild. It's a miracle. It truly is a miracle. Farming is a miracle. It's a lot of hard work, but it's also a miracle. And the same thing is true of salvation. We sow the seed of the gospel into the lives of people through social media, through sharing, through praying, through inviting, through all of those things. And then we rest. We stop. Look what it says this guy does. He puts a seed in the soil. He works hard. Nobody, farming then and farming now is not easy. We all know that. It is one of truly the hardest professions in the world. I cannot name, at least in this culture, one that's more stressful. Because you have so many elements that you cannot control. I grew up in a farming family. It's hard. It's hard work. But once you've put the work in, it says here, he goes to bed. He rests. He doesn't panic. He doesn't sit there on the, on the soil and say, okay, buddy, please, 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 please come out of the ground. He doesn't. He goes home and he goes to bed in this parable. He rests. He doesn't panic. Listen, there are people in your life who need to be saved. There are people in your family who hate God, who despise you. There are friends that you have that were hammered last night, that wanted nothing to do with your God or your Jesus. And your job? To sow the seed 
and rest. Your soul be at rest. Some of you have sons and daughters who are running from Jesus. Your job, plant the seeds and rest. Plant the seeds and watch God work. Did you know that on average, a person needs to hear the gospel nine times? The true front to back gospel that Jesus loves them, has died for their sins, was buried and rose again. They have to hear that on average nine times before they get saved. I don't know why nine. Some it's less, some it's more. But they have to hear the gospel nine times before they're saved. You sow the seed and you watch. You step back and you wait. Some of you are here this morning and you are just trying so hard to figure out how to reach that sun. You are trying so hard and just trying to figure out every angle and, and every, every possible solution. You know, if I post this or if I say that, I know they're going to be on Facebook at this time or I'll tag them in something. And, and you're just panicky about like this person coming to Jesus. Listen, Jesus wants you to know, hey, disciples, they're not fretting. They're not panicking. They sow the seed and they rest just like a farmer does because they know the results are on God. He does the work, not us. John MacArthur says this. I love this. I quoted him with exactly this parable here. He says, a great way to apply this is this way. You don't need to live your life in a panic. You don't need to stay awake 24 hours a day. Go to bed. Plant the seeds. Shine the light. And go to bed. You're not responsible for what happens. That's the wonder of it all. Disciples not only work hard to share the gospel, but they also, they rest and they watch God work because they know that God is the one who's in control. And then lastly, disciples not only witness and watch, but lastly, they wonder. They wonder. W-O-N-D-E-R. They wonder. Look at the last parable. This one is fun to process through and to understand. So let's go to the last parable in verse 30. And he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or by what parable shall we present? Literally saying, like, how can we sum all this up? How can we put all this together? How can we put a bow on the kingdom of God? How can we describe it? And he says this in verse 31. It's like a mustard seed. Which when was sown upon the soil, though it's smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. I want to invite the band back up as we bring all this together this morning. Disciples sow the seed of the gospel. They can't help it. They have to to communicate Jesus and what Jesus has done. It just pours out of them. And then they watch. They're not fretting. They're not anxious. They're not worried, not only about people's salvations, but about life in general. They watch and they wait. They trust their God. But also disciples, they wonder. He tells a story about a parable, excuse me, another parable about a mustard seed. How how can we sum this whole thing up? And they would have been very familiar with a mustard seed. Many of you maybe have seen a mustard seed, or maybe you at least can grasp it, but a mustard seed, I wish I had one. I wanted to bring one. I literally thought, I'm going to get one and bring it, but it's like, why? Because you couldn't see it. It's like, hey, I could tell, I've got a mustard seed right here in my fingers. I don't. I'm just kidding. See, it's not there. But I could, and you wouldn't be able to see it. It's, I mean, it's a grain of sand, maybe a hair little bit bigger than a grain of sand. It's a tiny seed, and they would have understood this. They would have understood that it's a tiny seed. Again, agrarian culture. And you put these mustard seeds in the ground, and you wait the whole process, just like he had already described. And then he says that when the mustard seed comes up, many of you may not know this. I did not know this until I began to study mustard seeds. But a mustard mustard seed can grow, a tree can grow up to 15 feet tall and over 6 feet wide. And producing millions of mustard seeds over its life. Upon millions. This little bitty tiny grain of sand can grow to be this great thing. And then he ends the parable really strange that these birds come in and they land in the mustard tree. It's like, what is Jesus talking about? Here's what he's saying. 
He's talking to these disciples. There's, there's 12 disciples and then a few other people gathered. There's a little, this is a, there's probably close to, close to a billion people on the earth at the time Jesus was saying this. Around a billion, okay? Here's him and about 22 more people sitting here talking about the kingdom of God. A very, 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 very small thing. <laughs> Insignificant thing. And he says, guys, listen, the kingdom of God, it's like this. This gospel, it's little, it's tiny, it's fragile, it's small. And what he's ultimately saying is when I die and I resurrect, I'm putting that seed in the ground. Remember, when he died, there was less than 100 people that would say, we follow Jesus. And they had all backed out anyway, but they were loosely connected to him. A very small thing, a very small movement, a grain of sand. Mustard seed in the ground. And then it begins to grow and multiply. The disciples begin to carry the gospel throughout the ends of the earth. The kingdom expands millions upon millions of times more than any of them could have ever asked or imagined. How does that apply to us? Your life is a mustard seed that has received the light of the gospel. You are a mustard seed. I am a mustard seed. A hundred years from now, all of us will be dead. And the reality is most of us will not even be remembered. <laughs> we, will do so, we will have such a simple life. This isn't a knock on anyone. This is a, this is a true of me. We will live such simple lives that we will not be remembered a hundred years from now. No one will know our names. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. Amen. Your life is a mustard seed with a very small light inside of it if you've been saved. The more that you plant that light into the lives of other people, the more significant the kingdom of God will spread. God's gospel started off really small, but it has expanded in incredible ways. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? It means that until we go to heaven, we wonder, we step back and just worship what God is doing through our lives and through the lives of millions of other people. Let me give you one story about somebody who is a, just a simple man who planted a few mustard seeds as we bring this together this morning. His name is William. Back in the 30s, he was a dairy farmer and almost lost everything in the Great Depression, but he didn't. He pulled it together. Small dairy farm over in North Carolina. Not very prominent, but a gospel man born again believer, got a great wife and had some children and he and a buddy of his named T.W. William and T.W. They would come together with a small group of farmers back in the 40s and they'd pray. They'd pray about once a week and sometimes once a month. They'd just pray for their community, pray for their children, just simple things with simple men. And they'd pray. And they began to pray that God would, would start a revival and a movement that would like, you know, begin to pray bigger prayers that God would just do great huge things from their tiny town. And William and T.W. and a small group of guys were also uh, organized a evangelist coming to their town named Mordecai Ham, which I would say 90% of you have no idea who that is, if you may. Somewhat prominent evangelist at the time, but not anyone famous. And they worked hard, and they prayed, and they organized, and they planned, and they got Mordecai Ham to come to their town. And he was hosting these revivals. He was preaching and, and, and hosting all these revi revivals, and people were getting saved, and people were making fun of him, and people were making fun of the movement, and it was, you know, just like any movement of God. And one night, a young teenage boy came in with his buddy, and they were troublemakers. They had some issues, some run-ins. They had some problems, these two 16-year-old boys. And they would make fun of the revival, laugh about it, laugh at people as they went in. Their God and their focus was girls and baseball. That's what they were living for. That's what they wanted to pursue. And so one night, they decided that they were going to go to this revival. They were, they were going to be a part of hearing this preaching. They want to hear what, what it was all about. And they went, and man, the conviction of God came upon them to the point where they wanted to go back, but they didn't want to feel like the preacher was preaching at them, so they sat in the, in the choir loft behind him so that he wasn't looking at them while he was preaching. 
And it was on the second or third night that these two young boys, after hearing the gospel from this evangelist who came because T.W. and a guy named William prayed and then also planned to get this guy to come, those two boys gave their lives to Jesus and were saved. They repented and believed in Jesus. Ironically, one of those teenage boys, that was William's son, a troublemaker that he'd been praying for for years, giving him up to the Lord. That young man, his name was Bill. But a lot of people called him Billy. William was William Graham. And his son was Billy Graham. Billy Graham went on to preach to 215 million people around the world and had one of the largest gatherings in human history in Seoul, Korea, North Korea. He had 1.1 million people hear him preach at one time. Because a dairy farmer, a poor dairy farmer, and a couple of his buddies prayed, and they worked hard to get an evangelist to come. The world's never been the same. My friends, you may be a William or a TK. You may be a Billy Graham. You may be 30, 60, or 100 fold. But the truth is, you have the opportunity to plant the seeds of the gospel into the lives of the people that you're around because God did not save you because he just loves you. God saved you because he loves the people around you. So this morning, some of you need to be saved. You're like Billy and his buddy. You need to be born again. You may be 16 or 60, but you don't know Jesus. You know about him. And so today you can find the love and grace and mercy of Jesus and be saved. Be born again and experience life and life to the fullest like Christ promises and receive the light in your life. And there will be pastors here, deacons here, that if you're here this morning, you're like, I need to be saved. I've gone to church, but I don't know Jesus. Then they're here. That's all you need to say is, I need to be born again. I need to be saved. And they'll walk you through. They'll take you right back here. We'll sit down with you, talk with you. That may be you this morning. But maybe you're here this morning and you're saved. But the reality is, the light is not shining very much through your life. I don't know what your basket is. Your basket may be your job. Your basket may be your sin. Your basket may be just your, the busyness of life. I heard someone say this last week that you know what busy stands for? Burdened under Satan's yoke. And I was like, that'll preach. You may just be busy. You may just be busy. I don't know what your basket is, but this morning you can come before the Lord and just get on your knees before the Lord and say, hey, I've been covering a lot of the gospel with this and I'm sorry. Please use my mustard seed life to let others come to Jesus. And it may be, it may be that at the end of your life when those people are waving, it may be four or five people that wave and say, yeah, I know Jesus because of Hunter. I know Jesus because of Sarah. But it may be 215 million. And it starts with you asking Christ to do what he wants to do through your life and you just surrender to that. Some of you may be calling to ministry calling to missions. There's no doubt someone here wrestling with that. Just say yes today to what he's calling you to do. Take the basket off your light and let it shine. Because God is good and life is short. He doesn't just love you. He loves the people around you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your...